so many people here to, to listen to Mary. Um, I'm going to do um, a quick intro to Mary in a second, but if I could just say that um, there are quite a lot of people on the call, so if you could um, mute yourselves, but you can introduce yourselves in the chat box and, um, and maybe put a little bit about why, you, why you've um, dialed into this um, or what is it that's caught your attention. Um, and during the, there are some people who don't have um, a mute on theirs, and so if you could just be quiet, there are a few people where it's not showing up, um, but um, if you could make sure you're not making a noise so that, because we can't mute you from this end, you see. Um, so then um, I'm going to do a quick intro to Mary, then she's going to do about 20 minutes of a presentation, and then there's going to be some chance for some um, questions um, at the end for another perhaps 20 minutes. So um, again, if you're putting your questions into the chat box, uh, Matthew is going to try and help sift some of those out, and, and, um, and then we'll call on you to um, ask your question, or he will ask your question for you uh, when we get to that bit. So that's just a quick run of how it's going to go, if that's okay. Um, so Professor Mary Ewell Bean is a leading pioneer internationally in complexity thinking and practice. Um, she's going to share the results of her decade long research program focusing on uncovering the key sources and mechanisms that enable innovation, transformation and change, including hospitals and across health systems. So of course the reason we're all here is a lot of us work in health and know the complexity of the organisations we work in, but also our own internal complexities and how the two um, merge together. Um, she's going to talk about the framework now developed for these lessons on how best to support new forms of leadership for adaptability and organisational agility, um, something that is high on all of our um, agendas, especially if you've um, plugged into this, um, I'm sure that's in your thinking. Um, Mary shows how tools such as labs, liberating structures, design thinking, adaptive salons and summits and positive deviance, a lot of these um, terms you'll be familiar with, some of the stuff you would have heard through Q. Um, which is, is great and, and how that's being used in practical terms um, through, through Mary's work is going to be really useful. Um, Mary also found that very different styles of leadership are required for each of the three spaces, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, enabling, um, um, adaptive space and the formal processes enabling um, the operational to function effectively. So. Um, that's just a brief introduction, I'm, but I'm sure I haven't done Mary justice, um, but I'm going to let her crack on um, and tell us about her very interesting work. Wonderful. Thank you, Esther. So I'm going to flip over here and share my screen and hopefully we'll be able to see this. So can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay, good. So it's not so easy to do this in 20 minutes, but I'm going to give it a stab. And what I'm going to do is talk about what's at the core of this kind of thinking. It's a very different kind of thinking about leadership. And what I want to do is start by talking about what complexity is and just give you a, a very simple definition and a description of complexity. Because I think if you understand the basics of complexity, it helps you to understand why we need to think about leadership so differently. So I'm going to dive right in with that. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is complexity. Um, I have been talking about this for a long time. We started this work in 2001. And this year, I teach undergrads. We have a leadership program. And I, I came here to work with that undergrad leadership program because I also do executives. And my thinking was I, I want to get us to think about differently at the undergrad level. So the, the rising leaders and then also the executives, the ones who are in the positions and organizations that can make this change happen. And this is the first year when I've been working with the undergrad students that I felt that they really got complexity. I explained it to them and I said, you have a homework assignment, go look in the news and bring some examples to me. And I had undergrads who were listing out five or six examples from the news and they were describing it and they really got it. So I think we are in a very different world now and what used to be difficult to comprehend is becoming easier. So the way that I like to talk about this, I actually got this from Paul Cillier in South Africa, um, that complexity, we can describe it in two words. And those two words are rich interconnectivity. So what this means is that at the core of complexity is interconnectivity. And I don't have to explain that. Everyone knows what interconnectivity is. And we all know that we're in a much more interconnected world today. And that's, it's that interconnectivity in that world that's so connected together that's generating the rise in complexity. So then what happens is you put the word rich in front of an interconnectivity and that's the complexity dynamic. And what happens is when things are interacting, when they come together, they're interconnected. In that interaction, complexity occurs through what we call a rich 
connection where they come together and they fundamentally transform each other or change each other. So in complexity, what's happening is that we have what's called a phase transition. And when events link up or when they bump up against each other, they create unpredictable events or unpredictable kinds of emergence. And once that happens, there's no going back. So an example that Paul Cillier used was the difference between complexity and complicated. A lot of people were using complexity to mean complicated. And even my undergrads were saying, well, let's just make it simple. And I said, no, it's not about simple. The opposite of complexity is not simple. The opposite of complexity is stable. So what you have to understand about complexity is it, it, that it's about dynamism. It's about unpredictability. This is why people talk about the VUCA world. So it's not about going simple. And the reason that I have a picture of mayonnaise and jumbo jets is because in mayonnaise, you have an interaction that is characterized by rich interconnectivity. So when you bring these components together of an egg and oil and lemon, it produces something that the first time this happened would be unpredictable. Nobody would even know that that would be generated from it. And the, the other reason it's complexity is because it's not decomposable back to the original parts. Now you take a jumbo jet and it's complicated. So yes, it has many different pieces. It's a complicated system, but when you put new things on it, it doesn't transform the other components. So when you attach a tire, it doesn't change the nature of the steel or the glass. When you put the seats in, the fabric or the, the material, the leather, it stays the same. In complexity, that's the difference. The parts fundamentally transform one another. Okay, so with that understanding of rich interconnectivity then, what it teaches us is that we need to understand that in an interconnected world, there's more potential for an inter rich interconnectivity or for complexity, which means the world is gonna be more unpredictable and we have to be prepared for that. And the other thing that's happening in today's world is this is happening much more quickly. So the speed or the rate at which these transitions happen is picking up. And that's where we talk about emergence. So if you hear people talk about emergence and complexity, to me, the core of complexity thinking is understanding that we need to pay attention to emergence. And the way that you do that in complexity thinking is you look to see trends or things that are happening in the environment around you that if they come together and link up, they could generate something unpredictable. Okay, now just think about healthcare. That's happening all over healthcare. Do you agree? So in healthcare, we see this right now. It's incredibly unpredictable. Now, I don't, I'm not as sure about the environment in England. I can tell you about the US, the American environment, because I'm doing a lot of work with healthcare right now. Nobody really quite knows where it's gonna go. Now, I'll say that we started doing some work when I came here in 2014, started programs with healthcare, and the complexity was a little more unpredictable then. It's now reaching a stage where I think it's starting to come together, but again, moving so quickly. Things like telehealth or telemedicine, um, things like going, moving away from hospital, more to home care, things like um, setting up urgent care clinics, doctors talking about the ways they interact with patients, that patients want to do things more through social media, they want to be able to communicate through Facebook, in fact, one doctor said, I'll, I'll never forget this, he was in a class a couple of years ago, and he said, I became a physician, and I, uh, this is the pediatricians, I became a physician because I love patients, and to me, it's all worth it to get the hug in the office. So I see this kid, and I give him a hug in the office, and you could feel the passion around that. And he said, but now they want to be on Facebook. So I'm not gonna see my patients in the office. It becomes more about technology or dealing with the computer and it loses that touch that I had. And so our comment back was, you've gotta make a Facebook like, feel like a hug in the office. So dramatic differences. Um, also differences in terms of the way things are being paid. We're moving away from fee for service to value-based healthcare. There's no clarity about what's happening with our regulation around Obamacare. So lots and lots of complexity, which is lots of unpredictability. Okay, so then if we understand that and get the basics of what complexity is, the question is, how do we need to manage in complexity? And what I wanna, what I wanna show you, we did, we had a grant from Booz Allen Hamilton and we studied six healthcare systems in the United States. 
for two years. We went in, we met with the executive team, we identified a strategic initiative, we then interviewed the entire executive team around that initiative. We then dove into the organization to study the strategic initiative to understand leadership and adaptability in healthcare. And this was around 2007 to nine that this was happening. And the complexity was starting then. It wasn't quite as big, although it was clear it was coming. Well, here's the key finding that we took away from this. Again, I'm trying to simplify a massive research program down into a key finding. But the basics and the implication were that while it takes complexity to beat complexity, what happens instead is that organizations respond with order. So leaders in organizations respond with order. And what they do is, if you look at this picture here, there are three different kinds of zones. So you've got an order zone, you have a complexity zone, and you have a chaos zone. If you're in complexity, what it says is that it requires a complexity response, which is an adaptive response. But what we saw over and over and in the organizations that we studied is that instead of doing a complexity response, they drove it down to order. So they focused on stability, they focused on trying to control it, they focused on hierarchical kinds of responses, bureaucratic responses, wipe out the things that contribute to, com to a complexity response. Okay, so with that in mind then, what we need to do is we have to figure out how to get away from that. And here's what it looks like. When you have complexity, you have pressures from the environment. So complexity is experienced in the form of pressures from the environment. And these pressures come in and they push you to have to change and do something different. But what happens in the middle, if you look at the middle top is, at, in response to complexity, many people don't like it. So what they want is control. And they say, take us back to where we were. We don't like this complexity kind of thing. This is unsettling for us, it's stressful. We like the world the way it was, so take us back. So there's a desire for control. And that's not only with the managers and leaders. So one, you could place blame and say, well, leaders, this is a problem because you're doing it. Well, part of the problem is we've trained them to do that. This is what we've told leaders their job is. So they're doing what we train them to do. But the other thing that happens is even those leaders who respond appropriately and try to take people into complexity, they experience pressure from the people around them and particularly subordinates or followers because they want things to get better. They don't necessarily like the environment that, that is required to generate an adaptive response. So in response to this, what happens is that the operational leadership kicks in, they tighten the administrative system, that leads to further bureaucratization and it stifles adaptability. So the response that we saw over and over again was the exact opposite response of what we need. And I think when you're seeing all these things on the Q website about these tools, what these tools are trying to do is help you not do this operational administrative response, what we call the order response. The tools are designed to help you think about how you can enable complexity to deal with the complexity world. But I just want to say, I'm going to go back for a second. If you're in order, you need an order response. So what this chart here is telling you is if it's order, be in order. But if it's complexity, you need complexity. So it doesn't mean that you go use these adaptive responses all the time. You use them when they're required, when you need complexity. And places where you can use order, by all means, use it. But don't use order if you need an adaptive response. OK, so here's another way to see this then. If we take that same chart and we look at the bottom, an order response is essentially a hierarchical, bureaucratic, top-down, standardized, control, um, blanket kind of response to things. And the other way that we see this happen is when individuals are trying to push for some kind of adaptability, what managers will do, that's experienced in the form of, of conflicting, which I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But in, the, in conflicting, when people are bumping up against each other and you've got conflict going on when they're pushing for different ideas, managers will step in and get rid of it. They'll wipe it out because they think conflict is bad. So that's another form of order response. Okay, so for many, many years when I was teaching this, I would say, well, you need an adaptive response. And then I would just quickly move on because in my mind, I knew what it was, but I wasn't quite sure how to explain it. So now we're at a more advanced stage and I can now show you more what that looks like. But this is the question we're going to answer now. If complexity takes complexity and it requires an adaptive response, what does that response look like? What does that mean? So here's where we are now with this work. 
What I want you to think about is that in the face of complexity, you need adaptability. So the question becomes, what is adaptability? And the way I'm using, describing this now is, I call it the adaptive process. It's a process. So what we're doing as leaders or as individuals is we're enabling a process. And we can think about this for ourselves too. This is a fractal dynamic. So the process I'm gonna, going to show you occurs on a fractal level. It occurs in my head. It occurs between two people, between groups or between organizations. So this dynamic occurs across scale. Okay, it starts with what I'm gonna call the need to innovate. You can call that need to innovate, push for novelty, change, new ideas, anything like that. And then there's the need to produce. So what happens in adaptability is, in the adaptive process is that these two things act as polarities. So this is the other reason you're hearing about polarity. Polarity is becoming important because polarities are increasing now with these competing forces that are pushing for adaptability. So we can change out the nature of what the circles say, but in adaptability, this is the, the core polarity. Change versus stability, um, push for novelty versus, versus push for results. Okay, so when you've got the need to produce, the pressure in the organization is current results. We know that this is there because we've seen the rise and the need for results-oriented leadership or the push for accountability, measurement, Anybody who's a manager knows that, especially in environments where, that, where there are a lot, is a lot of pressure, you, if you're in a managerial role, you're focused on results. So you have to produce. But there's also the push for novelty. And in complexity, there's always a push for novelty in organizations from some people who are creative. But in complexity, what happens is you really need that push for novelty. You need because the environment is shifting and it's pressuring you to have to do things differently, you need to have people come up with ideas. And the good news is that in most cases that happens. Unless an organization is very bureaucratic and very ordered, um, you're, you're gonna have people with ideas. So people then start pushing for new ideas. And as soon as that happens, these two things go into tension. So, You've got not only competing ideas and tension, but you've got push for novelty and tension with current results. So I'm sure you can relate to this. You're the Q community. You're probably people who are trying to drive change in organizations. I'd be shocked if you told me that you didn't have some ideas that you were pushing and they were running up against the system and you couldn't get them implemented. That's the, the core nature of the adaptive process. So it's that tension. And we discovered pretty early on when we were analyzing the data this, what I call the tension dynamic, is at the heart of everything. It's something that's just essential to understanding how to get to adaptability. But what happens in the order response is we wipe that tension out. So when we have tension, either we experience it in our own heads when we're being pushed for complexity, or we see it in organizations, we get tired of it or it's too challenging for us and so we wipe it out. So let's say there's pressure on me in my head, I've got to do something different. I just say, forget it, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. I get rid of the tension because that the competing forces are difficult for me to deal with. So what we have to do is understand that once you get rid of that tension, you are eliminating the dynamic that will save you in the long run. So I'm gonna change the word here now just for a play on words and to make it clearer because some people don't get the idea of tension and i'm going to call that conflicting and what i'm going to say is that this is conflicting needs conflicting views um, conflicting perspectives so if we take conflicting and we think about that being really the underlying dynamic of adaptability now if we look at the world we see a heck of a lot of conflicting happening there's conflicting happening everywhere right now. My students come up, could come up with a thousand examples right now of conflicting. I mean, all you have to do is open any newspaper, I do it online, but any news source, media, and you'll see conflicting everywhere. So if we were in an audience and in a room, I would ask you, to have conflicting is not enough. You need to have something else along with it. So what the other thing that you need along with conflicting is this, which is connecting. So in the midst of the conflicting, you need to find some way to connect. I think this right now in today's environment is our fundamental challenge, that we have a divide, we have lots and lots of conflicting, 
And I would say in the old world before com complexity came around, we always had some conflicting, but not like we're seeing now. People are empowered to say what they think. Um, social media and other things have increased the amount of voice. We have conflicting everywhere. So whereas in the previous world, we had less of that, we have a ton of it. But what we don't see as much of right now is connecting. And I think that's a skill, a talent that's needed. In the midst of the conflicting, you have to find some way to bridge the divide, some way to connect the ideas, to link up things that are going on to generate emergence. And that emergence is the adaptability. So in the midst of conflicting, if you listen to it and you can say, I hear this and this and this, and oh, wow, this new idea triggered for me. Now, in the midst of this conflicting, we can get to this new order. That's really what adaptability is about. So that's the core. And that's what we call adaptive space. So this process of conflicting and connecting is really at the heart of what we call adaptive space. Adaptive space engage in enable or is the way that the adaptive process occurs. So if we use adaptive space then and we generate adaptability, the really nice thing about the story is what it says is that yes, we still need to produce, so we're not throwing that away. So early on, I think people were hearing, well, we do this complexity stuff and that gets rid of our comfort zone and our need to produce and that just doesn't sound right to us. No, that's not true. You still need to produce. And we also know that some organizations have really emphasized innovation. But what I will tell you is that in emphasizing innovation, what they're missing is the adaptability. So in innovation becomes a component, but it only works if you engage it appropriately with this push for, or, for the need to produce in adaptive space to generate adaptability. So production gives you current results, adaptability gives you future viability. And the reason that many people feel like they don't need to do adaptability or do adaptive space is because they have enough resources that they can continue to operate in the, need, in the production mode or zone and the resources will hold on to them and their survival is not threatened. And this is gonna become critical for NHS because I think the key thing is really whether your survival is threatened. And if you don't have that, it's very hard to enable this adaptive process. Okay, so I'm going to leave lots of time for questions, but that's the core dynamic. So then what we need to take away from that is that's adaptive space. I just changed out conflicting and connecting to make that adaptive space. As leaders, we need to be enabling this process. If we say, as a leader, you should enable complexity, this is what we need. You need to generate the adaptive process by enabling adaptive space. Those tools that you see are ways to enable adaptive space. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you real quickly how this works in organizations. So I'm gonna tell the same story, but I'm gonna show it a little bit differently because I find if you repeat and tell things in different ways, people will get it. So here's a, a somewhat different story, but same thing. So I'm gonna describe the tension dynamic. All organizations start out entrepreneurial. So that's that novelty, learning, innovation, growth. As they grow, they bring on an operational system. The operational system is the control system that generates results. As soon as they do, these two things go into battle. And I've done this presentation for many years and I say, when they go into battle and they start fighting it out, which one wins? And every audience I have resoundingly says operational wins. I have never had anyone say entrepreneurial, although I will tell you that I have a case study of an organization where entrepreneurial is winning. But operational, just by the nature of where power lies, and authority wins in this. So what happens is that when pressures come in on the system, the, it generates tension. So the pressures that are happening in the forces on organizations right now are creating opportunities for organizations to be adaptive. They generate the tension, that feeling inside that we have to do something different, think the world's changing. But in response to that tension, what we've taught leaders to do and the way we've organized our systems, our, our organizational systems, is we wipe out that tension. And when we wipe out that tension, we're wiping out the entrepreneurial system. So in many organizations, entrepreneurial systems shrink, operational systems get really big. I would guess that many of you operate in worlds like that. So in response to complexity then now, what we can show is that an adaptive response really requires that conflicting and connecting and what it is is a network. So it's a network response and I don't have time to go into detail on this because we could spend a whole lot of time just on this chart. 
but I want to move on. So if we can come back to it, a few questions about it, but essentially an adaptive response is a network. It doesn't mean it's a network, a static network. It means that the response is networked interactions. And that's an important distinction because many people think, well, it's a network. No, it's networks activating. They're very fluid and very dynamic. Their nodes and the lights link up, light up, the links light up, and then it moves and it changes around a lot. So it's networked interactions. And then if we map that onto organizations, what it looks like is this. You have the entrepreneurial system, the operational system, and you have a flow across in terms of what this looks like. So again, I know I'm going quickly. This is kind of the fire hose, but hopefully you're getting the basics of it. What happens in this network response is that you have the entrepreneurial system where ideas start to form and then people start to push the ideas out and adapting occurs when those ideas get pushed out into, into adaptive space and they link up and connect through networked interactions that then flow across the organization and make it into the operational system. And what you notice in this picture is the operational system then becomes ordered. So what operational system does is it creates a new order. And if you have an adaptive system, that's happening on a regular basis. So it's flowing in, it's creating ongoing new order, and that's what we call emergence. But in organizations, we have the problem of bureaucracy. So when you try to push the system and drive against it, it's like this picture. You know, it's bureaucracy bloat. And about the only thing you can do is you can cut the fat off. But if you cut it off, it's just going to grow right back again. So you're continually dealing with this problem of bureaucracy. And the way that we describe this in our work is it's like hitting up against a brick wall. So you might be a person with new ideas or a change agent or someone who's trying to, to drive some form of novelty. And as you push it out, you find that you hit resist, what we've traditionally called resistance, I call the brick wall, and it just stops it in its tracks. Now, the thing I want you to know about this is, although you might perceive this as bottom up, it's not necessarily because what we see is many CEOs, many executive teams who are also hitting the brick wall. So executive teams try to be entrepreneurial and push new things out. This brick wall can happen anywhere. It can happen in any direction or any flow in the organization, but it's really the operational system resisting the change. Okay, so you, you hit that. Now, in organizations, what we need to do is understand that instead of it being a brick wall, we need to recognize that that is a natural part of the process, that you should be expected to hit the brick wall, but don't perceive it as a brick wall. So I'm gonna show you an animation. And in this animation, I'm gonna have an agent, which could be a person, an idea, a resource, technology, whatever, it could be a group. And this agent begins to have an idea. And so it starts to resonate and it starts to get some energy. And as it continues with this, what will happen in this process, this adaptive process in response to complexity pressures is they'll start to say, yeah, let's think about this. And then locally, on a local level, they'll socialize the idea. So they'll run it by somebody and they'll say, I've got this idea, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think that's really good. I think you should try it. So then they try it and then somebody else says, yeah, that's working for me too. So you start to get some energy. And if a person's doing this well, they're actually running it by people who will push back on it too. So people, this is a process of, that some authors called collective creativity, that you're in a small local group, you're experimenting with the idea, you're testing it out, you're pushing it against different things. And so it starts to build and you can actually get some change in a local system doing this. Okay, so then what happens is, and I see this over and over again, people who are doing that, these entrepreneurial forces then try to get it out into the larger system. And so they'll reach out to others and you'll see now I've got different colored groups there because these are now outside of the local, you're crossing boundaries into a different part of the organization or part of the system and you have some connecting. So people say, yeah, that sounds really good. But inevitably what's gonna happen in that process is you're gonna hit conflicting. It's going to happen, there's no question about it because it's part of the adaptive process. So when you hit that conflicting, many people perceive that as the brick wall and they say, "Uh, it's done, stopped, we can't do anymore. But what I would say to you is no, expect you're gonna hit it 
Don't perceive it as the brick wall. Instead, understand what's going on, prepare for it, but also take, the, take what's happening there as information. So there's some things you can do to prepare for it, which is there are strategies around how you go out to avoid it becoming a no. One of the key things is don't ask for permission. Don't ask, don't run it by people who are decision makers who can shoot it down. Instead, float it as an experimental idea. Because once they shoot it down and there's a no, it's really hard for you in that system to be able to go anywhere with it. You're stuck. So there are strategies around how you go out in the first place. But when you hit conflicting, what you need to do is go back to your local, take the information, iterate it, think about what you heard, and try again to see if you can refine the idea to get it so it can work in the other part of the system. Okay, so once you do local iteration, you then send it back out. Now in this picture, what you see is now you see circles around these other colors. And the reason is this, if you take a new idea out or something entrepreneurial and you start to change the system, what it's telling the other parts of the system is they have to change too. So that's why it's so difficult for them. They have to change, they have to do something different. And that's not an easy thing necessarily. So now the iteration occurs more in those other groups and those other pockets or parts of the system that need to make adaptations. And you need to recognize that. So when this starts happening, now you're starting to, to build to scale. You're starting to get something bigger going on. But I also wanna say to you, what that iteration looks like there may not be a, uh, an exact model of what you did. Many people think I've got the idea, you have to go take my idea and do it in my way, or it has to look the same. And that was kind of what we were doing with benchmarking. It's like, let's go out and find best practices and then bring them in and put them in our organization. No, you can allow for this to be flexible enough that re you recognize the idea or the, the core of what you're trying to do might be implemented and look different in those other areas. So that's critical as well. Okay, so what happens next is that you then continue this process and now you've got connecting, you're starting to build, you've got some energy, you've got the start of a movement, you've got some emergence, but you've got more conflicting. So as it continues to flow across, you're gonna continue to have conflicting. Expect it, embrace it, engage with it. That conflicting is necessary. It's not a bad thing, it's not a problem. Okay, to get it into the operational system though, you need to now recognize that the operational system has a problem because it's not, a, it's not structured to accommodate change. So the key thing in the operational system is so many of them are rigid. In healthcare, all you have to think about is IT systems. I hear this all over healthcare. Um, every time we do a physician leadership program now, we're bringing in IT people and trying to build connections with IT because that seems to be the, the core structure that's so rigid that's bogging everything down in terms of being able to change. So in this picture, what we have is this gray dot and the gray dot is the sponsor. The sponsor is the person that helps you tip this into the operational system. So at this point, you've got to try to get it in into a new order. And that person or people plays a key role in helping to generate the new order. So they do connecting. They then um, help make the operational system flexible or adaptive or their work, they work ways. They either pull it through or they push it through to get it into the operational system. And then once you get it there, you've got adaptability in the form of new order. Now this can happen on any scale. It can be on a very micro level and happen in a quick process, or it can flow all the way across the organization into large scale change. Okay, so bottom line, we need to enable the adaptive process. And that's what we need to do as leaders. We do that by generating adaptive space. Adaptive space comes from understanding this process and creating the environments for this conflicting and connecting to occur in a way that generates new ideas. So things like, I can't remember all the tools you mentioned, but design thinking, liberating structures, they're all tools to help us understand how to, um, op how to create and operate in adaptive space to generate adaptability. Okay, so Matthew, I went as quickly as I could. We've got 25 minutes left. I know I'm gonna turn it over to you now and you can start the conversation for us. Hi, Mary. Yeah, I think Esther was gonna kind of share the, share the ah, question. Okay, um, Esther. 
Oh, I, okay. There are um, people that I noticed already. Um, I don't, Esther, do you want to kind of invite people to put them in the chat? I, but I've noticed a couple. Yes. Well, if you can mention the couple, then people who are wanting to put the questions can start to write those in. Uh, the ones I saw, um, Sam McIntyre was asking about whether there are good and bad areas for novelty. Do you want to explain that question a bit, Sam? If you can unmute. If I, you're actually, I actually think I get it. If you, let me take a stab and Sam, if I didn't get it, let me know. But um, it's a really good question. And this is where... So are there good and bad areas of novelty? Meaning are there good and bad ideas? And the answer is yes, there are bad ones. And there's also bad emergence. So you have to be careful about that. Um, with ideas that come out, everybody thinks their idea is good or, or worthwhile, but it may not be. So you have to understand that this adaptive space, the process of conflicting acts as a filter. So what we try to do is we make that brick wall, when I have longer times to present it, I'll turn that into a wall of resistance, which looks like a filter. And it serves as a filter to filter ideas that are good and take ideas that are not so good and keeps it out of the system. So yes, absolutely, good and bad. And you can get some bad emergence. Did I answer it, Sam? I'm, I'm not sure Sam has managed to unmute herself. Um, oh. there, there was a question from Tracy. Tracy, do you want to ask your question or should I um, fish it out of the chat? Are you there, Tracy? Well, maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll give you the gist of what, what Tracy said. And it's Tracy who leads Q's um, lab, uh, or they're just starting on the second uh, big lab at the moment. And, she was asking, what if people are very good at generating new ideas, but not at delivering them? And there ends up being a sort of yo-yo backwards and forwards. And, and you know, does that kind of... Uh... Absolutely. In fact, quite often people who are good at ideas are not good at delivering them. That's spot on. And this is why, you know, this whole thinking about leadership has become, why I talk about it as a process, because it's not just a person. So... You, it takes many people quite often for this process to occur. People can bring different skills and capabilities to it. So it's not always the case, but quite often people who are entrepreneurial are not good at the adaptive space. They're not good at, at, at advancing the ideas. So they need partners or someone else who can help them do that. Um, we can call that energizers or connectors or challengers, but it's a d very different kind of skill to think about how to enable that adaptive process than it is to think about generating ideas. It's the difference between creative types and ones who are more, who are better at engaging or facilitating the process. And then there are others who have really good skill at the operational. So it's, it, this is a system or a process where many different kinds of leadership are needed. You might have some individuals who are good at all of them. And I'm just gonna say, just because of the work I do and the nature of this, I, tend, I personally tend to be able to do any of them. So I can jump between roles if I need to, but that's only because I studied this for so long and this is what I do. But the vast, and I know some other people who are like that, but the vast majority of people are not like that. So you have to have different types of people working together in partnership to get this done. That links into um, Cleo Butterworth's question about who holds the adaptive space. Thanks, Cleo. I hope that's asked, answered yours as well. Um, but another question there is creating time in the work to engage the adaptive space. So trying to make that happen. That is one of the biggest challenges is creating the time. The truth is this takes more time. So, and many people just get, they don't have time to do it. They get frustrated by it. So that is something the organization has to do is make sure that they um, create the time, the space for it in terms of the time to be able to do it. There's, there's no question about that. Now, the one thing I will say is it does, it's always, I think always going to take more time, but it saves you in the long run because if you can do it well the first time, you're saving problems that you might get later. The other thing is the more you do it and the better you get at it, the more quickly you can enable the process. So mm -hmm. if you can get people up to speed to where they understand how to do this, they can act more quickly. And I think we studied, after we studied uh, the health care organizations and we started to understand this problem and generated this model, we then tested it against highly innovative and adaptive organizations. 
And in those organizations, they have this process down. They can jump in and out of it. They're flexible in terms of being able to, to go into adaptive space and then come back out. Um, Heather Shearer has, come, has asked um, an, um, another question. So the further contradiction to create the time, we often emphasize and empower lean um, by trying to operationalize. And so this is looking at your picture, your model there. Um, that's exactly what that's saying. Yeah, so we emphasize how we're lean, which means we're getting rid, rid of people. I think this could fit in lean, but lean has to have the component of understanding how to lead differently. So you can't just do lean, meaning that you're gonna cut out people or cut things, do cut out non-value added work. As part of lean, we know that there are different processes that come along with it. You know, people talk about TQM and other things. I would say that lean or, or agile or TQM are all things that are pushing up against what I would call the more traditional ordered world. So they push up against the edge of that world to say, we need to do things differently. But I really think you need to jump into the complexity world. So where lean really comes to life is if you, if you leapfrog it into a different way of thinking, which is the complexity thinking or complexity world. Okay. Esther, I want to jump in with one comment about pressures because mm -hmm. I mentioned this earlier. And then I also want to comment on something that Matthew had written me when we were doing prep work. Um, when it comes to NHS, and I think we should get into some specific examples that you all bring up around NHS. The challenge I see with systems like NHS, and I do work in Canada, so their healthcare system is more similar to England, I think, or to, to the UK than it would be to the American system. The problem you have is a core assumption of complexity, and I mentioned this while I was talking, is that systems are pressured, but they have to be pressured for survival. So it's a, a strong enough pressure that people are forced to change. And I've also done work in Australia. Lots of government systems or government organizations. While you can get some change in them, the core challenge is that they don't have that real pressure in the way that private organizations or organizations that have really strong market forces do. So if you look at what's happened in the transformation of organizations and disruption, it takes disruption for them to really change. When you've got a system like NHS, it doesn't have that disruption. <clears throat> I work in higher ed, it's the same thing. We have so many protections that really were not being disrupted. And so I see many people doing things the way they've done it forever and they'll continue to do it that way. And so it bogs down this process. So I wanna point that out as a very, um, very legitimate reality of the challenge of doing it in a system like NHS. And then Matthew had mentioned to me that he thought one of the problems might be that you might, organizations like NHS might not be as good at conflicting. And so it might be that you do wipe that tension out and do ordered response and get rid of conflicting. And there could be some value in thinking about how you engage the conflicting. So just a couple of additional comments. Mm -hmm. um, there's another comment from um, Catherine Wilton um, about the, the political environment um, and things getting shifted and changes to, because um, people need to control and share power and, and things get pulled out of shape. Um, and um, so compromise is in there. So can you say a little bit about that, Mary? Wow, the political environment's really, really difficult right now. I mean, my, uh, it's, Mary, my it's, question was um, in the examples around the disabled people's movement, where there's a strong feeling that so-called allies of the movement uh, hijack the ideas and, and uh, it becomes their agenda. So it becomes then a model which the system adopts rather than this pure idea of disabled people taking control of their own lives. And yet we know that change only happens if people adapt and iterate it. So how do you kind of manage that tension between those two and the need for compromise to change anything? Oh, it's such a great question. And it's, I feel that one to my core. That's a real challenge. And I'm glad you clarified on what the political environment is. Um, when I teach this work, po understanding politics and the political environment, and I mean by that, I mean organizational politics or system politics. I don't mean national in terms of the political parties, although that's part of it too. It's really essential. You ha it, it, this is a very political kind of thing and movements can be hijacked. So people can, if you start to generate some emergence and you've got energy, people can hijack it. And, you know, 
so much of leadership has a very strong normative element to it. So if you look at traditional leadership, we always present it as leaders are these great things and they do these wonderful things. They're inspirational and authentic and um, transformational and everything normative. This model is not normative. And it's that way on purpose. We don't talk, I, I know that it comes across as I talk about it as this is all good, but it's not necessarily all good. There, It's neutral, it's just like power. So if you understand power, you know that power is neutral. It can be used for good or for bad. It's the way it gets used. It's the same with this process. It can be used for good or for bad. And there are political dy dynamics in it. So you have to be really politically savvy to understand it and understand and people who are, I will always worry in teaching this work because people who understand the dynamic can easily hijack it. They can take it and run with it in ways that they don't, that they want to. So you have to, I think, even more understand the dynamic. And sadly, you can't assume good. So the practitioners I work with have been pushing me so hard on, they call it the inner journey or purpose. They do all this value stuff around it. I'm like, ah, I don't care about that. All the traditional leadership stuff is done and I'm more into the dynamics. And they say, no, 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 this is core to it because you have to understand the inner journey and the purpose. This is very emotional, very, um, very purposeful, very passionate work for many people. And sadly, you have to know politics. You have to pay attention to it. Don't assume good. Did that answer it, Catherine? Thank you. Um, I've got another question here from Mary, Mary Salama. What about patients traversing many systems that aren't connected? How do you fix this? E oh. Individual trust in social care, housing, education. Oh, what a nightmare. So here in the US we have public broadcasting or PBS, so public TV. And last night I had it on. I was watching Ken Burns, who's a documentary, he does documentaries, and he was doing the Mayo Clinic. And it was really interesting because the whole thing of the Mayo Clinic is set up around the team and the whole thing is set up around the patient. So everything, I mean, you talk patient-centered, it's the extreme and patient-centered to the extent that they pay doctor salaries and they, they'll have lab results results in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the whole thing is there set up around the patient. And I was watching it, knowing what I know about healthcare, thinking, why doesn't all healthcare do this? It just makes so much sense. I don't understand it. And I also always wondered how Mayo got there. I see now that they did it from the core. This is quite often what happens in organizations. It comes from the founder and the founder's values. And the, the founding physicians, the Mayos, this was their model. Um, so I look at it and I say, it only makes sense to me that these things should be connected and it should be patient-centered. And the way that we describe this in organizations is that we have these silos and we know that silos are bad for interconnectivity in organizations. We need to break down silos. In business organizations, that has been happening. And that's why we saw massive, massive restructuring revolution that happened primarily in the US in the 1990s. I was teaching during that time. Everything was about the restructuring revolution. It was trying to fix our structures to make them more interconnected, to break down silos, increase communication. And in fact, now it's almost gotten to the point where there's so much communication, people are overloaded. So that's the challenge. But I think healthcare needs to do that. The challenge of that is, again, if you don't have the pressures from the environment that are gonna force it, it's hard. If you're trying to change an existing structure, it's very hard. And I have lots of conversations with our practice group about this. I'm working with someone right now who's a CEO of a major media organization. He's struggling with this because he can't get his organization to, to change quickly enough. And the conversation we're having is, do I just start something new and try to grow it from new and then transition the organization that way. And one of the leaders that we worked with in Australia did exactly that. He was a serial entrepreneur who started, had organizations realized they needed to change them, couldn't change the organization. So he would do a startup uh, in, basically in the same company. And he would put some strong people in that startup and then he would feed and fuel it to get emergence. And then he'd start pulling some key people over and then pretty soon that became an attractor and he was able to morph the whole thing. Now, again, you see the challenge of that in, in NHS. I'm not going to underestimate how difficult this is in a system 
that is structured, established, and bureaucratic. It's very difficult to do. So I think the conversation there has to be different in terms of what does this mean and what kinds of changes can we get done. But to the extent that you can take advantage of technology and start increasing interconnectivity across, the better off you are. Okay, thanks Mary. Um, I've got another question from Cleo Buttle who asks if um, communities of practice are adaptive spaces. <laughs> that was Matthew's question earlier. Yes. yes, they are. And I think that they become really critical. Um, it's funny. I want to talk about this real quickly. I'm going to sidetrack for just a second. I was driving in and I was listening to the radio and they were talking about esports. I don't know if you've heard of esports, but esports is these gaming communities. And the, we're now sensitive to them in the US because we had again another shooting of an esports gaming place in Florida. So they were following up on that and saying, what is this? Well, they had a guy who was from a university, he actually close to here, SMU. And he was talking about gaming and they were saying, well, what is this? What is this all about? He said, essentially the reason gaming has gotten so big is it's a community. It's a community and people are attracted to the community. And just like sports is a community that you see when you go to a stadium, this is just like it, but it's online. And as I was thinking about it, I thought about communities. And the reality is that we have these communities happening online all over the place. We can't see them. People who are in them experience them and they're very powerful, powerful for them. And if it's the case, he said, what people need to know is that many college students now coming in have an identity with an esport person versus a true athlete on campus. Now, if we were to play that out and that really took off and that was a serious trend, that could actually tip the whole athletic system in combination with other things that are happening. Let's say um, parents getting upset about kids because they're trying to change American football to make it less violent and have less health impact. But you take a confluence of certain kinds of events. If people aren't paying attention and don't know what's going to happen, that e-sports community could tip the system into something very different that could disrupt college athletics. I don't see that happening soon, but it could happen. So that's where communities come in. Communities become attractors. They become sources of emergence. Um, they aggregate things. They create environments for people who are like-minded to come together, but if they're affected, they also create opportunity for the conflicting. So they have the conflicting and connecting. If they can grow emergence and grow scale and generate adaptability, then by all means, that's what they are, their adaptive space. I can't hear you, Esther. Sorry, I've got a question from Shelley Valair saying, do you have examples of organizations whose senior leadership has transformed their thinking to value emergence? In my organization, there are people in the middle who get this, but our execs don't necessarily know how to lead in this space. How do we help change this? That's such a good question. Um, I have, and in fact, in some of the ones I've seen where the senior execs get it, they get frustrated because the rest of the organization isn't getting it. But I've certainly seen the example you've talked about. Um, for many years, we did work in Australia because they had a, complex, a complexity MBA that they were doing. And so they were teaching complexity early on and they'd have me come each year and talk about this. And so I was working with the, the DMO in Australia, the Defense Material Organization, which is their um, equivalent to the American Department of Defense, the DOD. And we would go in each year and we would train people. So I'm gonna tell a quick story. I'm gonna try to make this quick. I would go in and one year I went in and they'd asked me to do a half day workshop. I'm doing this workshop. I've got a, a couple, a woman and a couple people in the room just sleeping. I mean, it's a half day workshop there in the front. They're like, they're sleeping. It was horrible. It was painful for me. I thought I had this great material, but they're sleeping. So the next year they said to me, we want you to do an all day workshop. I said, are you kidding me? They were sleeping on me last year. No way. They said, no, no. These people really want to come in. And in fact, we have a waiting list. We already got a bigger room and we still don't have capacity to do this. And they went all day. I said, really? They said, yeah, it's all the people who you've talked to all these years and the people that have been through our training, pro our MBA program. So I go into the room and I have my slides ready to go, you know, to talk to them about it. And what happens is the group is 
already there. The energy in the room is fantastic. They start asking me questions. They say, how can we do this? So I was like, this is fun. This is great. Now I don't have to do all this. I can actually engage with them. And what I did was just create an adaptive space for everyone in the room to start talking. And they had questions and their questions were, we get it, we get it, we get it, but our top leaders don't get it. What do we do? So that was the stage of the work. And then I actually ended up facilitating the top, a top team minus like the top one or two people in department in DMO who were trying to figure out how to do this. So I'm going to tell you that is a huge challenge, but you can do it. You can't do it directly. What you have to do is link up what you can present to them with the needs. If you think again about conflicting and connecting, what you're trying to do is connecting. So figure out what their needs are and figure out how you can slide things into the system in ways that it satisfies their needs. And if their needs are operational or whatever they are, have the stuff come in and, and feed it. And don't push on them in a way that they, you tap into their fears. So the way to manage polarities is you can't push too hard on a polarity because it makes that lock up. It will, it will make it tense up so much that you're creating more resistance. You kind of have to slide it in. You have to reduce any kind of fear. You play it in the language that they know and you give them results. So a quick example of this, um, I worked with Michael Arena at General Motors on this work as we were doing this and he actually had gotten fired three times. <laughs> The third time he actually truly got fired, but he just did, he said, I just didn't leave, but they, he had got pulled out of it. And once he got pulled out of it, all the people that he had enabled inside in the system, um, he continued to fuel it from underneath. So he was kind of a hidden enabling leader and they said, we're not quitting. And then they continued to energize the stuff. Well, what happened was there was a crisis at General Motors and the crisis was the ignition switch Plus they had a change in CEO and they were testifying in Congress and Mary Barra, who was the new CEO needed some good news. She needed something exciting to tell people to show the great things they were doing at GM. So these people who were working on this adaptive space and the entrepreneurial stuff inside, it was labeled GM 2020. So he put a tag on it. It started to bubble up and people at the top were saying, what is this thing? And so Michael's boss who fired him comes to Michael and said, do you know this GM 2020 thing? And he says, yeah, I do. So they actually were able to take that and get it to Mary Barra. So it came up from within because it linked up with the need that she had. So don't take a direct approach in terms of trying to force it on people or tell them they need to do something differently. Find a way that they can get results. And I've seen this play on other places as well, where, um, their organizations are systems that the enabling leaders inside are really savvy about trying to generate results and generate adaptability in ways that everybody can share in the credit and they feel the benefit of that. But it, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of tenacity, a lot of work on the part of the person who's playing the enabling role. So you need support groups, you need coaches, you need outside communities, you need escapes from the day to day so that you can go and refresh and, and re-energize yourself to keep doing this work. Okay, Mary, we're just about for the last question. I know I'm running things a lot, a, along a little bit, but um, there's one last question if we can. Um, do you have any advice on how to measure the success of an intervention based on this theory? Oh, that's a good question. So I still have this slide up. You can see adaptability, right, on this slide? Yes. Here's what I'm going to tell you I discovered when I wrote this in the academic paper this year. Um, we, here's the core problem, and I didn't know it until I did the lit review to figure out how this all mapped on to what we know from the, the research literature. Even people who are doing adaptive work or adaptability work are still using production outcome measures. So the essence of this problem is that our measures are still performance measures. And I looked at that and I said, oh my gosh, this is terrible. We're doing malpractice. We're doing malpractice because we're talking about adaptability, but every measure is performance. So my response to that is we need to start identifying some adaptability measures and outcomes. Um, if I had a double of me, I would be doing that lit review right now to see if there's anything in the literature at all that talks about adaptive measures and outcomes. I didn't discover it until too late in my review, so I don't know if it's there or not. 
it's not prominent for sure. I didn't see it. I probably would, if I looked with the lens, could uncover it. But I don't think in organizations they have the right kinds of outcome measures. So what I would challenge people to think about is if we really understand what adaptability is, we need to start putting in some measures that are adaptability. And when I speak with practitioners and audiences now, I've been asking them, I haven't gotten good answers from them. Some people are saying, we're gonna work on it. And I say, when you work on it and you discover it, feed it back to me so I can share it with others. So I think that's a, a core challenge. And just to tag on from Trish again, um, have you published your lit review? Yes, that, that it's not gonna be fun for you to read necessarily because it's an academic <coughs> paper but I can send it to Matthew. It's a leadership quarterly article that we did this year. And I, what happened was um, in typical fashion, it's very difficult for me to get this work published because most of our research studies are one study that are very reductionist and very micro, and they take a long time to publish. And what happened in the research program was that as we started it, we were getting all of this emergence and things were changing so quickly and there was so much learning and discovery going on that if we had written it and locked in any of that language, it would have been a problem for the field. But then once we got it figured out, the story's so big that it's not a one study. So I've probably got to write a book to explain all of it. Um, so what I did this year is I wrote that LQ paper as a way to try to get it into the academic literature and it's more of a meta framework or a meta theory. And it pulled together five different fields. So we're crossing strategy, we're crossing innovation and creativity, we're crossing um, networks, leadership. So uh, there are findings out there all over the place. The problem is nobody's pulling it together. We don't need more research necessarily, although some of the research we're doing is really good. We need people to start pulling it together to understand in a framework, how these pieces go together and what they tell us. I'm very confident there are lots and lots of answers in the literature out there if we continue to, to aggregate in that way. Okay, thanks, Mary. That's, um, that's really great. You'll be tired after such an intense um, questioning. Um, but we are just about out of time. I just wonder if there's any final comments, Mary, or any, any observations from yourself? Well, I hope that you didn't get any, get the fire hose effect. You see that there's a lot here and just a lot of conversation. And I hope you get the basics of the core process and how this works. That, and if you start to think about this, what I want you to know is it doesn't come easily. It's not natural necessarily. It takes some work and some time to get your thinking this way. Mm -hmm. And I think that the community can really help if you process together to try to understand what it means. Okay. Um, Matthew, any final thoughts or comments from you? Um. Just to say, uh, maybe people could join the special interest group that set this up if they haven't, uh, closing the gap, uh, SIG that Esther leads, that's one thing. But yeah, I'm always inspired to read Mary's stuff and it, it keeps on getting more, more fruitful and more simple at the same time, which is kind of really good, which is part of the reason I understand it, because she's, she's kind of nicely dumbed it down for people like me. <laughs> Lovely, thanks Matthew. So um, we'll call it a do if that's all right. Um... And, and everyone else, please join us for our next um, um, webinar, which I think is happening in a couple of weeks, Matthew, isn't it? I don't think we've actually got a, d a date uh, for it. Uh, well, keep okay. your eyes out for the date. <laughs> yeah, and that will be more about kind of inner complexity, kind of adult development, inner complexity side of things once that date's finalised. So that's maybe a compliment to, to Mary's stuff. Mm. The two halves of complexity that we're somehow putting together in, in the group that Esther has formed. Good. Yeah, that's, good. that's lovely. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks, right. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Excellent, Mary. That was